Bob Berg wrote in his book, writes about the fact that a CEO of a large corporation at his retirement dinner got up to speak. Now this is a black tie affair, the entire corporate world that he had been in for the past 25, 30 years were there. And he gets up, <clears throat> before he speaks, he looks around the audience and he says as follows. By looking around, I can see that many of you wish you had my job. CEO, major corporation, certainly a coveted position. But I just want you to know that I recently went to my daughter's wedding. And at my daughter's wedding, I saw her best friend. I didn't know her best friend's name. I don't know what books my daughter has read. I don't know what music she likes. In short, I don't know my daughter. I'd like to share with you one thought he said. Now that I'm retiring, I can say to you, if you'd like my job, you could have it. I don't think it's worth it. And with those words, he sat down. And what he was saying with those words was a very powerful testimonial about the fact that he spent his life, arguably according to most criteria, very successful life. And he certainly planned his life, he certainly grew, he certainly reached various plateaus, milestones, and he reached a certain point at the pinnacle, at his retirement dinner, where the world is gathered, and he said the words, effectively, I made a grave and serious error, I blew it. I spent my entire life doing something to the exclusion of everything else, and I regret it dramatically. And it's rather interesting that the human oftentimes can do very, very foolish things, look intelligent, look like he or she is thinking, look like they really understand it but are spaced out. There are very, very few people on their deathbed who regret saying, hmm, shucks, should have spent more time in the office. Many, many people have the opposite regrets. And the only ironic part about it is that these same people spend a lot of time thinking, spend a lot of time planning, Yet the big picture issues as to what life's really about, what am I doing here, and where will I be 20 years from now, they never deal with. Now, the reason why this particular issue is very no gay, very applicable to us, is because the Masul Sharma, as we mentioned last time, begins his entire sefer with one yesod. And that yesod is yesod hachasidus, the yesod, the actual foundation of all righteousness. The Shorah Shavoda and the source of serving Hashem is one thing. If you'd like to know what the root of proper service to Hashem is, it is for a person to ask himself, what am I doing here in this world? What are my obligations? Why did Hashem create me? What am I doing here? What is life about? And the Mesut Hashem says very, very powerfully that that's not just an issue that you should think about, not just an issue you should deal with, it's the root, it's the core of our entire religion, and ironically, it is probably the single most significant question that any human being, religious, secular, or atheist, should ask himself, and that is, I'm living, I'm very busy living, I'm doing, I'm planning, I'm plotting, and I have entire things that I've laid out for the next five years, ten years, What's it all about? Why am I here? What's my, the plan? What's the purpose? If I accept the fact that God created me, if I accept the fact that Hashem put me on this planet, gee golly, there has to be a reason, but what is that reason? Why am I here? What's it about? And what is the purpose of my life? And ironically, it's the kind of question that people just don't ask. Intelligent people, what you would presume are smart people. Ironically, Tom Watson, who was the founder of IBM, had a beautiful office, and if you'd walk into his office, you saw the $10,000 mahogany desk, and you saw all the ornate furniture, and over his office, as you walked in, there was carved out a beautiful archway, and on the archway were five letters, T-H-I-N-K, think. Now, you have to appreciate the fact that Tom Watson, who was the founder of IBM, surrounded himself with very successful people, captains of industry, intelligent, well-educated individuals, Yet he had to put this mantra up there, think, because what he was trying to inculcate into the culture of IBM was think. Think. Put your brain on on. Don't just do, don't be robotic, don't just go through the motions. Think. And ironically, we human beings are a rather curious breed. We can act, we can plan, we could look like we have all the answers and the most fundamental, most basic issue to it all. Why am I doing it? And what's it about? We don't deal with, we don't think about. And the reason why that's not just ironic, but rather sad, is because one of the great difficulties 
that a human finds himself is in is if I pursue something long enough and hard enough, I might acquire it. I might actually get it only to discover that it really doesn't have the meaning that I always thought it did. And one of the points of life is that currencies tend to change. I'll give an example of what I mean. When the early Ford Model T's came out, they were sold for $700. You were able to buy a top of the line, brand new Ford Model T for $700. Today, you can't buy a new car for $700, nor for $7,000. The reason is the currency changes. In the early 1900s, $700 was a quite a substantial sum of money. With it, you could buy a new vehicle. You can't buy anything with that amount of money now because it just doesn't have the same value. And currency t tends to change. I remember very vividly, my grandmother, Lashalom, was a very generous person. And I was a fellow, I was in yeshiva at the time, and when I would go to visit her, she would always offer me $10. I didn't need the money, even though I certainly wasn't working. My parents took good care of me, but it was only respectful. She wanted to give it to me, so I would take it. When I got engaged and I brought my kala to meet my grandmother, she was very happy to meet her, and when we, we were taking our leave, she took out a $10 bill and she said to me privately, here's $10, five for you and five for parallel for my kala. The reason why she said that expression, five for you and five for parallel, is because $10 was a significant amount of money. She wanted to make sure that it was distributed equally, to make sure that, <clears throat> that Peril got five and I got five. You see, Grandma grew up in the Depression era. <clears throat> Grandma grew up in Germany, actually, in the 20s. And <clears throat> she understood that a dollar was a lot of money. But the currency changed. <clears throat> and no longer was a dollar a lot of money, no longer was $10 a lot of money. But if your currency changes <clears throat> right in front of your eyes and you set your goals based on it, oftentimes you could find yourself in a very different place than you thought you would be. An example of this was a gentleman who was a stockbroker, and a very successful one. And his grandchildren were invited to the reading of his will. It was known that for many years he had planned that each of his grandchildren should be given a tidy sum of money that they should be taken care of. And his grandchildren were all brought into the lawyer's office, the will was taken out, they read the will and every one of them were vastly disappointed. Why? Because in the will it said that each of his grandchildren were to be handed the tidy sum of $5,000. Now, $5,000 is a nice amount of money, but it's not life-changing. And it's not the kind of sum that makes a difference in, in a person's life. If you buy a house for half a million dollars, $5,000 doesn't go very far. But you see, this gentleman had begun his financial plan back in the 20s and 30s. At that point, $5,000 was a fortune of money, enough to take care of his grandchildren's needs, and he worked very diligently, worked very, 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 very focused to reach that goal, and at the end of his days, he reached that goal, he was able to leave $5,000 to each of his grandchildren, only to find out that that money had lost its value. And the reason why I think this is a huge, huge concept <clears throat> is because the reality is that all of us in this world live with certain values. There are certain things that take on a tremendous amount of importance, whether it be money, whether it be honor, prestige, being popular, being good-looking, whatever the <clears throat> issues are, the currency of this world becomes very, very important to us. And the Masilla Sharm shares with us one tremendous, tremendous concept, and that is, I will leave this earth. I, the one who occupy this body and will separate, and everything that I valued in this world will become worthless, utterly, totally, and completely valueless. And it's not like it will have a little bit of value. It's not like it will be somewhat important. It will have absolutely zero, totally no value whatsoever. And if I could ever get that concept straight in my mind, it would change vastly life. Because all of those things that are tempting, again, whether it be money, whether it be honor, whether it be prestige, whether it be somebody hurt my feelings, somebody said something, my need to take revenge, my need to speak back to another person, all of the various issues no longer would mean anything. Because if I could clearly understand that there'll be a time when all of this will pass and will be utterly ridiculous, I would live my life in a very different way. However, that concept takes a long time to really 
sort of sink in, and the truth is we never fully get it, but this single understanding that that which I value now will change, the currency will change, <coughs> is a huge step forward to understanding the Mr. Sharma's perspective, the understanding perspective of true value. And I have a muscle that I think well sort of defines how most people make a mistake in life. In other words, most people go through what I call changing paradigms, where one day one thing is important, the next day another thing is important. There was a fellow who I was in yeshiva with who was a yellow belt in five separate martial arts styles. Now, if you study martial arts or if you're familiar with it, yellow belt is the lowest rank. Now, the way he became a yellow belt in five styles really was quite interesting. When he was in grade school, he was very interested in martial arts and he began in a particular type of karate. And he learned the stances, learned the punches, learned the kicks, became proficient, took his first ranking test, got a yellow belt. Then, as it worked out, he was then went away for school, he went away for high school, so he now found himself in a new city, now had to begin again, he looks for a similar style, couldn't find the same, so he had to start in a new style of karate. Well, everything was new, new stances, new kicks, new punches, so he started from the beginning. <clears throat> he started from the beginning, after about a year or so, he took his first rank test and reached the rank of yellow belt. Well, after his ninth grade in school, he moved on to another place, New style, new beginning, new stance, new kicks, new punches. Took the first test. After five years, he reached the rank of yellow belt in five styles. Had this same fellow spent those five years with the same amount of practice, the same amount of diligence in one style of karate, he would have been a black belt. He would have been a master. But because he was in one style, and then another style, then another, he diversified so that he reached the level of rank beginner in five styles. And I think that that is a very apt mushal, a very good parable for what many people do in life. If you study the average person, and I'll do this from a guy's perspective because it's easier for me, but I want you to take a very typical secular fellow growing up in the United States of America. When he's a little boy, the only thing that matters is toys. Toys, toys, toys. When he turns about 10, 11, 12, it's basketball. That is life. And everything that he has, all of his time, resources, energy, goes into him becoming the best basketball player you could ever imagine. And that lasts till about, he's maybe 14. And when he's 14 years old, now it's girls. Everything, his energy, his resources, goes into being popular, good looking, and etc. And that lasts for a while until he turns maybe 16 or 17. He wakes up and says, oh my goodness, i got to get into a college. So he starts working on school. School becomes the emphasis, becomes the focus, becomes everything he focuses on. And eventually gets into a good school, lands himself in a college. Now it's his career. Now he's worried about what career I'm going to get, how am I going to get the first job, how am I going to advance. He gets the first job, he begins advancing. His career is well on its way. Now he's worried about retirement. And he spends the next 30 years focusing on retirement. And at 65, he now wakes up and recognizes that he has spent his entire life focused on one thing, then another, then another, with ever-changing paradigms. He ends up being a yellow belt in five styles. And what I mean by that is as follows. If a person never asks themselves this question, what am I doing here? What's the big picture issues? Why did Hashem create me? What am I really about? What's my real life goals? You will spend your life pursuing one thing, then another, then you're going to change, you're going to change into something else, and likely you'll be successful in every one of those areas, but you as a human being will have failed. Why? Because you never really became what you could have been. You never really grew, you never really accomplished, and the reason is not because you weren't diligent, not because you weren't focused, not because you weren't working, but because you weren't focused on what it is that I should be doing. What am I here for? Why does Hashem create me? What's my purpose? And ironically, you could live your entire life, and most people do, without asking themselves this question. I get it. Hashem created me. Hashem put me on the planet. Why? What's it all about? Why am I here? Why did God put me here? What does Hashem want from me? What's it about? And again, thinking very rational people can never deal with this question. And the irony of it is, when a thinking person doesn't ask it about themselves, that's one problem. But what happens when a person begins settling down? Besides, they get married, have a family, and now you're going to raise the next generation. You're bringing children into the world, 
and now you're taking a grave responsibility on yourself. And eventually, your child is hopefully going to ask you the questions, or certainly it's going to be your responsibility to deal with the question of why. What are we doing here? And the astounding part of the human is, you cannot just ask the question, you can never deal with it, bring children into the world without thinking about it, bring grandchildren forward into the world, bring them up, and never deal with the why. And every once in a while when people start asking the why, they get the glazy-eyed look, we can never know the answer, who knows the answer, and people spend their entire life without ever getting a clue as to what they're living for, what life's about, and it's a rather sad day when at some point they wake up and realize there's got to be a reason. And they'll try to say, well, it's for the next generation, it's for my kids, so my kids could have a better life, so that they could have kids but then you realize that they're going to have the same dilemma, the same empty life, the same lack of purpose, and the cycle never ends. And it has got to be one of the strangest phenomena on the human, of the human race that we can go about life without ever asking this question. And sadly, it's sometimes true even amongst religious Jews. Sometimes you could have from people who are even somewhat learned or somewhat observant and go through much of the motions and never deal with this issue. And I guess the manifestation of this is when you find what I call jaded Jews. When you find Jews who are really depressed, who are worn out, who are tired, who have no energy in their religious observance, no energy in life. And the reason for it is because they're lacking exactly what the Sulaisham says. The Yisod, the source, the root of all religious observance, that means the absolute foundation of all of, of our Avodah Hashem is to understand why, what does, why does Hashem put me on a planet? What does Hashem want from me? And what's it all about? Now, once you deal with that question, the answer is very, very powerful. So Hashem says it's for one simple reason. Hashem put us on the planet to give to us the way we enjoy that gift is by working, by molding ourselves, and by shaping myself into what I'll be for eternity. This world, as we said before, is the gym. This is where I work out. This is where I grow. I accomplish. I become a different human being. The world to come is the spa, is the place of enjoyment. But at the end of the day, that is the reason for existence. The very purpose for existence, the very reason for his existence is for me to grow, for me to use this world properly. And if a person doesn't deal with this question, it is not a great secret that they have a tremendous lack of meaning, a lack of purpose, a lack of direction in their life, and they're vastly unhappy. There is a tremendous amount of unhappiness in the world we live in. We mentioned in a previous session, despite the fact that there's never been as much freedom, and never been as much opportunity, never been as much material wealth, and yet there's so much depression. And a big part of that is quite simply because if there's no plan, if there's no purpose, there's no reason to exist, I will be depressed. And if you'd like to see the manifestation of this, I'll share with you a very interesting phenomenon. In the society we live in, everyone argues about the fact that life is invaluable. Life is so valuable, so precious, you can't even put a number on it. If you'd like to see a manifestation of that, Go into a hospital emergency room on any evening, especially late at night, and you'll hear the code being called in. They'll call it in from the ambulance. <clears throat> Human being is on the verge of life and death. The nurses get ready. The doctors get ready. There's a certain fever pitch in the air. Once they, <clears throat> once they bring the stretcher in, you could see they go into overdrive. They run. They move. There. And there's a human being. A life is on the line, and there's such intensity and <clears throat> such focus. Despite the fact that this human being was involved in a bar fight, despite the fact that this human being was likely the cause of a lot of trouble and is not exactly the pillar of society, it doesn't matter. There's a life on the line. Every person there is focused on what can we do to save this life because life is precious, life is sacrosanct. Okay. Now, that being said, I'd like to share with you a very interesting observation. We all have a certain amount of years on this planet. Assuming I'm 20 years old, I could argue I have 100 years left. If I'm 40, I could argue 80 years, 60, whatever's left. Point being, there's a certain limit to every human being's life. It's a number of years, whether it's 10 years, 20 years, 40 years, that's all that's left in my life. What it means in plain language is, if you'd like to know the totality of my life, what my life is, it's time. You see, I have 
so many years left, and that is my entire life. If it's 40 years, that 40 years is my life. That's all I have. Once those years are gone, there is no life left. So if I were to actually be honest about what I call my life, that invaluable commodity, that precious commodity is actually just an issue of time. How many weeks, how many months, how many years, how many minutes that make it up. That being said, here's a very interesting thought. If you ever listen to people, especially college students in the society we live in, talk about something called killing time. Yeah, I had a couple of months to kill, so I just <clears throat> sat around. I, I started a bottle cap collection. Yeah. Oh, you started that? Oh, yeah. I'm also into that. I collect empty beer cans. Oh, yeah, that's a good one. Yeah. Yeah, how'd you kill time over the weekend? Well, it was just, you know, <clears throat> some, that expression, killing time, is very, very telling. It's very telling because what it means is I have this block of time and nothing to do with it, so I might as well kill it by what? Whatever. Entertainment, watch TV go to a movie, collect bottle caps, play in the sand, because life itself, that which I claim is so valuable, really isn't. And when you find a tremendous contradiction between people arguing that life is so precious, yet their life itself is so valueless, the reason for it is, is because they don't understand life itself. They live in such an utter contradiction because while instinctively they know life is precious, the life that they lead is empty, meaningless, purposeless, so why not just kill some time? When a person really understands life fundamentally, one of the changes is time becomes immensely precious. Time becomes precious because this minute of life is a minute that I could change myself, change others, change the world. It's a valuable, precious commodity because I understand what a minute, what an hour, what a week means. With that sense, a human being has a very different perspective on life. If the human being really has that perspective, life isn't just precious. There's a drive, there's an empowerment. You get up in the morning with a tremendous sense of energy and a tremendous focus. I have this thing called a day. I have this thing called an hour. What can I accomplish with it? What could I do? That is probably the most enjoyable state that a human being can ever experience in this world. However, if life has no meaning, if I'm just here for whatever, and it just doesn't matter anyway, then life itself isn't precious. Life itself is empty, meaningless, and you could talk about killing time, and it really doesn't matter. What the Vasil Sharm is sharing with us is the fundamental truth of life. And that is that if a person doesn't deal with the real big picture issues, if a person doesn't ask themselves what's it all about, they're destined, A, to be unhappy, but more significantly, they will never succeed at life. Because there'll be a yellow belt in five styles. They'll pursue this endeavor, then later on this endeavor. After that, they'll go into this. And they'll be very proficient in various things. But the currency itself will change. If you were a major investor in silver or gold in the 20s and the 30s, and you made a huge sum of money, you walked out with $10,000, and you bequeathed that to your grandchildren, in the 21st century, it doesn't have that value because the currency changes. So the Sharm shares with us that the greatest single change in currency is that everything that we value in this world, all the trappings of this world, all material possessions, all honor, all relationships that we value so here will become absolutely, completely valueless. What's valuable in the world to come is one single currency, and that is the changes that I made in me, the changes that I made in others, the help that I brought to other people, the additions to other people's lives. Torah and mitzvahs are the ultimate value, the ultimate currency. Now I don't perceive it that way, but when I leave this current existence, when I leave this body, I'll understand it that way with a vastly different perception. Let me close with a very interesting mushal, I think a powerful parable that sums up this concept. And you'll excuse me for jumping into a little bit of a different <coughs> culture. Why don't you imagine that there were two fellows, Joe and Frank. Secular, we'll make them not even Jewish for the moment. Joe and Frank were roommates in college. Joe was always a bookworm, studying, studying, studying. Frank was a party animal out there on campus, big man on campus. Everybody knew him. Frank, buddy, yeah, hey! 
Frank always felt bad for his buddy, his roommate, Joe. There was a geek studying all day long with the books and the books. Joe, why are you wasting your life? Get out there. Come on, let's go. Well, <clears throat> Frank tried what he could, but you know, these geeks just studying can't change them. Anyway, they each graduated college. They went their separate ways. Now, <clears throat> as it turned out, Joe graduated top of his class, went on to a top medical school. Frank, well, he graduated with a D average, never really found himself. And they each sort of met up some 10 years later. <clears throat> Joe had just graduated recently, had a tremendous position as a surgeon in one of the top private practices. Frank never really could find himself. They meet up 10 years later when Joe pulls out of his Maserati, his imported sports car, buttons his $1,500 suit, and gets out to walk into the supermarket. Who does he see behind the counter cutting fish but Frank, buddy, Joe, how you doing? And they hug. Wow, I haven't seen you in so long. <clears throat> Frank looks over and Joe, and Joe goes, Joe, is that a custom-made suit? Wow, I really like it. Yeah, and Frank, I, I like your apron too. Oh, Joe, is that, a, is that a Mont Blanc pen in your pocket? Wow, I like your big also, man. What's At that moment, at that moment in life, Frank realizes something very, very powerful. For the rest of his life, whether he's cutting fish, laying bricks, or driving a UPS truck, he realizes then that he blew it. He had an opportunity to make himself into something. He had an opportunity for an education. He had the opportunity to better himself, and he blew it. But it's not just at that moment, it's every time he has a mortgage to pay and he can't figure out how he's going to pay it. Every time his kids say to him, how come so-and-so's parents take us to all over and you can't take us anywhere? For the rest of his life, he will mourn the fact that he didn't wake up, he didn't understand, he lived in such a fleeting, foolish existence. And I believe that that is a very apt muscle, a very powerful parable for life because the reality is we have at our fingertips precious commodities. The opportunity to do a chesed, the opportunity to learn, the opportunity to change myself, to change the world are so available to us. And the reality is some people wake up, some people get it, some people hit a track and they just head for the sky. And many of us just sort of whatever, hanging out there, just doing it. And the shocking reality is that every human being will wake up to this understanding at a certain point in our life. For some it will be when they're 20, some when they're 40, some when they're 80, many won't wake up until it's over. But at that point, when we leave this current existence and we understand the world with a vastly different perspective, everything that we valued will be valueless. And the things that we thought were so unimportant will be hugely important. And at that moment, it will greatly be satisfied and happy with the correct decisions we made and vastly unhappy with the poor ones that we made. Now if I could actually shut that and we could get to work. <laughs> Just the red button.